Welcome to LSE IQ, a podcast from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where we ask leading social scientists and other experts to answer an intelligent question about economics, politics or society. LSE IQ is one year old, and to mark its anniversary, we're looking at the theme of arguments, how to make them, evaluate them and win them. It's a feature that's underscored our previous episodes, from people arguing that democracy is declining to why we shouldn't wage a war on drugs. So what makes a good argument, and more importantly, what's the best way to argue effectively? In this episode, producers James Ratti, Natalie Abbott and Sue Windybank consider how to debate with conspiracy theorists, see how US intelligence agencies are building tools to formulate better arguments, and ask whether certain people and points of view are too dangerous to confront. To begin with, James and Natalie visited a place famous for its fervent arguments. Speaker's Corner was established in London in the mid-1800s. Lauded as a space of free speech, people continued to congregate here. It's a loud and disorganised affair. People stand on small homemade plinths to eulogise to and debate with the crowds. In the centre of one group, a woman is campaigning for a more feminist interpretation of the Quran. At another, people debate the nefarious power of bankers. All the while, preachers from across the religious spectrum implore others to follow the teachings of their holy texts. And people return week after week to listen and talk. It's very, very good. Um, and it's much better than the internet because um, the internet is kind of very soulless, kind of anonymous, kind of, you know, you can be anybody, you know, uh, just sitting in a room. Whereas here, <clears throat> if you if you say something, like this man picked me up on something and I picked him up on something, but well, we can still talk and still be friends and and you can learn a lot here. And um, how yep. many years have you been coming? Probably, I think, about four years, but it's probably more. But, um, yeah, I really enjoy it. I say it's better than the internet because if you say something here, uh, you've got to back it up and you'll get criticised and it's really good, it's very healthy. You go up to a real person in real time and get a real answer. Arguments at Speaker's Corner are loud and contentious. But what's the best way to cut through the noise and evaluate who's right? Socrates famously took to the streets to argue with others, but what principles did he and subsequent philosophers use to evaluate arguments? Away from Speaker's Corner, I spoke with two academics from LSE's Department of Philosophy. I asked Dr Owen Griffiths, who teaches the course Formal Methods of Philosophical Argumentation, how arguments are composed. In all areas of academia and in all walks of life, you, you'll come across arguments. You'll come across people trying to persuade you to believe something on the basis of some other things which they think you already believe. And at the basic level, logic's just trying to give you the tools to be uh, to, to not be misled. So when we say argument in, in philosophy, we don't mean it in quite the everyday sense of uh, some sort of disagreement that might be going on. So we normally mean some sentences, which we call premises, which you put forward to try and establish uh, another sentence, which we call the conclusion. So it's a sort of ordered object involving sentences, some of which are there to try and convince you of, of another one, the conclusion that follows from them. And what we do is develop tools for assessing arguments that are in that form. So we're interested in whether the conclusion does indeed follow from the premises that have been put forward. And there are really two steps in that process. The first is uh, tidying up the language in which the argument is presented to, uh, to translate the English uh, or whatever natural language we might be starting with into a, into a formal language, a language which is necessarily free of ambiguity and, and vagueness and which wears its meaning absolutely on its face. Can, there can be nothing misleading about it. And then the second step, once we've put the argument into that form, is to assess it, to run a test on it, and there are various different tests available, to see if the conclusion does follow from, from the premises. So wherever you find these, 
anything that remotely resembles an argument, you can ask yourself, and often it's a very fruitful question to ask yourself, does this conclusion follow? And yes, I think a basic education in, in logic makes it a much easier question to answer. So is there one system of logic that can be applied to all arguments? Dr. Brian Roberts doesn't think so. My view on arguments is pretty relativist. You know, I don't feel there's like one true correct way. Arguments come from logics. They're associated with logics. It's like the precise mathematical definition of an argument. And there's just lots of logics out there. There's like, you know, classical ones that sort of resemble Aristotle, but there's, there's lots of other logics, modal logics, logics that allow contradictions, all kinds of interesting things. People get away with some crazy arguments on the street. You know, you, you could say just about anything, um, you know, Things I commonly identified as fallacies pass regularly in the street, you know. Well, Joe's an idiot, so we can't trust his decision. He took us to that crappy movie last time, so we can't, you know, trust Joe this time. That's an ad, hom that's an ad hominem argument. It's not a good argument, and it wouldn't fly in a philosophy course. Uh, but there could be more interesting arguments. You know, by induction, I've noticed that Joe repeatedly, time after time after time, selects a really poor film for us to watch. And so by you know, induction on past history, and there's, there may be a, even a logic associated with this, uh, I have a high degree of belief that the movie will be bad again if I trust Joe. Brian was brave enough to appear on BBC Radio 4's The Moral Maze, in which experts are rigorously cross-examined by a panel on a prescient moral issue. I wondered what the show, which depends upon an ability to argue effectively, was like. I noticed the other day on your website that you uh, appeared on The Moral Maze. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. This which... interview is so much easier than that. <laughs> so thank no. you for that. <laughs> the, the, the level of stress uh, oh, that you must have gone through is like, uh, I can't imagine. You know what? I had just arrived in the UK that, you know, I think like a couple months earlier. I, I knew about Radio 4, but I had honestly not listened to The, to the Moral Maze. I, had, I just had no idea what I was getting into. It's sort of, I was like, yeah, it'll be a nice, friendly chat. You know, they ask an expert. Oh man, it was like having your hands pressed into coals, <laughs> but so, in a friendly way, you know, they were yeah. gentlemen. And, so and tell ladies. me about that experience. What was it like mounting an argument in, in those conditions? It's very, very adversarial. Yeah, it was. Yeah. In some ways it felt more like the way I perceive political arguments, where often the aim is to get in your soundbite. So people were often saying a soundbite and then they'd use a very emotive example. That environment is hard because they, they want to push the sort of man on the street, you know, emotive, quick, soundbite type uh, argumentation. Um, but, you know, a true philosopher, if you can manage, you, you, you stick to your careful argumentation. You stick to the facts. Do you think there's, there's a place for emotion in arguments? Yeah, I mean, we're human, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, maybe, I, maybe different people have different places for emotion in arguments, but, um, you know, why do you, why do you ask any question at all? I'm often emotionally invested in, in, in my questions. Emotions, then, are integral to arguments, and it's evident that arguments have the power to both enrage and upset us. But are there positions that are too emotive or contentious? Natalie Abbott has been looking at the issue. I met with Dr. Bart Kamets, an Associate Professor from the Department of Media and Communications at LSE, to ask him how you win an argument. I think there's a rational aspect and there's an emotional aspect, and the emotional aspect obviously can sometimes become uh, problematic in terms of winning an argument, uh, if, if that becomes too too prominent. Uh, but it should be somewhere there as well, and that's the fire, the passion uh, that, that you put in, into uh, arguing and winning an argument. In 2017, Tommy Robinson, former leader of the English Defence League, was invited to appear on Good Morning Britain with Piers Morgan and Susanna Reid. Dr. Kamets has argued that this was an unethical decision on behalf of ITV. The discussion descended into a heated debate. Fear. It's not irrational to fear these things. Winston you're Churchill... sounding like a complete Winston lunatic. Winston Churchill... No, I'm, I'm quoting previous some of the best leaders in this no, country. you're sounding history. like a bigoted lunatic. No, I'm not. So, Somebody Will, that basically... Winston Churchill You are an Islamophobe who uh, hates Islam. No, I don't You basically Islam. think all well, Muslims are to blame. No, We've seen you it. on video no, saying it. And I what you're doing now is deliberately inflammatory. It is deliberately you, poisonous. How is this inflammatory? And you are having I'm the complete opposite effect to the one that you... I asked Dr. Kamets why he thought ITV's decision to invite Robinson was unethical. Do you invite uh, an extreme right uh, leader um, onto a platform of, of, of a broadcaster? Or, or basically the broader question, do you give a platform to uh, people who are anti-democratic, racist, who, who have a set of discourses that are uh, about 
hating the other. Um, and I think uh, you don't. Uh, I think you, you you should not give an, a, an unfettered platform to 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 uh, people like that. These discussions intersect with discussions on freedom of speech and the limits on freedom of speech, but also in terms of what the public sphere should be about and and how media. Uh, has a social responsibility uh, in society and how journalists have a duty, at least that I, I think so, to defend uh, democracy. So you mentioned a little bit about how the opposition uh, position might be that, oh no, it's our journalistic duty to represent the whole spectrum of the debate. Um, maybe Piers Morgan might say he was doing that, you know, he was calling him a bigoted lunatic and a racist. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think Robinson can be benefiting from that position um, and how would you respond further to those criticisms? Mm -hmm. Now, this also goes towards a kind of broader reflection on how, on the populist era that we live in today uh, and, and how populists in that world view, the journalist is part of the problem. Uh, is is part of the one percent is part of the establishment which is juxtaposed to the people but in a right-wing or extreme right-wing context the people is defined in a very circumscribed manner but there is a juxtaposition being constructed between the people and others and and journalists are part of these others and so challenging the challenge that, that takes place, which, which, which can be quite aggressive even, like Piers Morgan, Morgan did, fits that populist narrative in a kind of fascist discourse. The media are the Luger Presse, the, 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 the dishonest media, what Trump says. Do you think on the other side of that, by completely removing their platform, um, you provide more of a space for them to argue, oh, it's political correctness gone mad, or we can't say anything these days? Do you feel like the reverse can also create the same reaction? I don't think it's enough of an argument to, to kind of then give them a, a platform to, to disseminate their discourses of hate. The kind of critique of political correctness, I've never quite understood what is wrong with not being racist, not being uh, disrespectful towards others or people with minority identities, be it ra racial identities, be it sexual identities. So then how would an institution such as ITV, um, how, how should they go about deciding who and who is not worthy of a platform? By what position do you measure this? Where, where do you draw the line between what is acceptable speech and what is not acceptable speech? But for me, uh, it, the kind of values of democracy, of equality. These are, in essence, liberal values, I guess. But that's, for me, the kind of um, line, red line, let's say. And that also goes towards uh, Popper's paradox of tolerance. If, if the tolerant are so tolerant that they also tolerate the intolerant, the intolerant will destroy tolerance. Uh, and so that's also something that we, we should reflect upon in, in that kind of in, in that context. We can have these discussions without necessarily needing to give a platform to fascist leaders uh, on in, in, in the mainstream media. The EDL is one of six organisations that's banned from speaking at UK universities by the NUS's No Platform Policy. In recent years, there's been more publicised demand to remove the platform of a wider set of speakers. In 2015, students at Cardiff University unsuccessfully attempted to no-platform Jermaine Greer on the grounds that she's previously expressed transphobic views. So, should Greer's views be considered as hate speech? If not, where do we draw the line? I mean, she has a right to speak and she has a right to be invited, uh, by all means. Uh, like I said, my, my kind of criteria is this kind of adherence to democratic values. Politics is always about differences about fighting, about conflict in, in, in many ways, um, about different positions. Now, if, if the discussion about, about fascism and fascist leaders, for me, that's a discussion about antagonism. These are my ideological enemies, so to speak. But if we are talking about somebody that I did disagree with on, for example, trans rights or Boris Johnson on a kind of more political ideological level, they are my adversaries.
which means in a kind of Mufian language, that's an agonistic relationship. I, I, I vehemently disagree with, 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 with their arguments, but they are adversaries and they are not enemies, which means that within a democratic space, they are legitimate to exist. Now, the other thing is student organizations also have a freedom to invite or not invite certain people or ideas or views or, or, or arguments. And, and so that's, uh, it, it's not because I don't think that Germaine Greer should, I don't think she should be not plat uh, no, no, no platformed. Uh, but I also think it's the freedom of, of, of a student union to not invite her. Natalie was speaking with Dr. Bart Kamertz. Martin Bauer, Professor of Social Psychology at LSE, has done some research on conspiracy theorists. Sue spoke to Martin. She was interested to know whether it was possible to argue with people whose views of the world seem irrational to many of us. We often think about conspiracy theorists perhaps as being irrational, they've developed these theories independent of fact, and therefore impossible to argue with. But this isn't what you found, is it? We often use conspiracy theories as a kind of a, a, a label to put on somebody else. We, are never have a, we, all, we never have a conspiracy theory. We have only the truth, and somebody else has a conspiracy theory. So what is a conspiracy theory about? A conspiracy theory basically tries to explain an event by some kind of nefarious actors having engineered that event for a purpose to get, uh, to get you, so to speak. Now, this is, uh, is an important uh, possibility uh, that we are able to, to, to see that and, and to perceive that and talk about it. The problem with conspiracy theory might be that we are seeing a nefarious actor at work when it's actually pure coincidence. But we have to recognize that conspiracies exist. Conspiracies are, are important uh, political uh, tactics. You can read a book uh, by Machiavelli who says you how to be successful in a conspiracy. I, I think I've heard you say that conspiracy theorists aren't necessarily mad, but they sometimes they overreach themselves. Yeah, I think that's what we, that's the kind of a, that will be kind of a working assumption. A lot of work about conspiracy theories is in principally trying to identify the madnesses of the crowd, and then try to debunk them by saying uh, they are resilient to information or something like that. We are starting from a different uh, uh, initial assumption, that the assumption that conspiracy theory is a, is, a, is a functional form of mentality, identifying nefarious agency, but it can overshoot. Do you think you can argue with people that have these kind of ideas about the world? Trying to argue in, in the sense of winning is there's probably a limited, uh, limited way forward. I think what one would have to find here is a, is a way of understanding and, and winning them over rather than winning the argument. But if you want to work on, on uh, conspirat conspiratorially minded uh, mentalities, I suspect one would have to start with, uh, with a form of understanding, uh, trying to get into the world and, and maybe create a, a common ground on the basis of which one can pull people out. And there is this idea in science that if that if only scientists convey to the public all the facts about controversial issues, that they would be convinced. But this isn't the case, is it? The idea that uh, it's the facts that will make a difference, or the evidence that will make a difference, uh, is, is not going far enough. Clearly the facts are crucial, the evidence is crucial. I think it's better to also to assume that people might be differently motivated. People might have different values might stand slightly in a different world. And then facts is not enough, because one would have to consider that facts are also grounded in some kind of assumptions. And if people don't share the assumptions, they might not necessarily uh, easily agree on the facts. Martin teaches rhetoric as part of a course on social influence in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science. How do you use rhetoric to prevail in an argument? But rhetoric reminds us of the fact that a good argument might be not sufficient or a truthful argument might not be sufficient, but you need to use other things. So classical rhetoric reminds us that we need also to consider the audience in terms of appealing to them, playing with the kind of things the audience is already familiar with, anchoring the argument in, in a language that the people are familiar with, and, 
And also, that's the, the, that's the second argument, is that uh, uh, rhetoric reminds us that uh, an authoritative voice is also crucial. An argument can easily be lost if people don't think the speaker has a certain aura or certain kudos. So these three, uh, the ethos, the logos and the pathos, uh, or the three musketeers, as we kind of uh, throw it at, uh, at the students, is a kind of an, uh, an argument or is a, is a reminder uh, that arguments are not sufficient. So when you want to win an argument, uh, rhetorically, uh, you might want to consider uh, an appeal and you want to consider uh, to, to play on the, on the authority of the speaker uh, in that sense. However, this has a complex history because rhetoric, I also think, uh, the way I'd like to teach it, includes a certain orientation on the truth. However, the word rhetoric is used in many different ways, and it often is used as a kind of a way of avoiding the truth. But there are, kind of, there are two, there are two uh, decadent forms of rhetoric. They have a different name. One is called heuristic, which is basically going back to the, the first question that uh, an argument is a contest. Heuristic basically concerns itself with the idea of winning whatever the cost or whatever the circumstances, even if you're wrong. That's heuristic. There are tricks of doing this. And the other one is sophistic, which in principle is also kind of a decadent form of, of rhetoric, one would like to say maybe, where the, the, the problem is that you try to insinuate the wrong conclusion. To make, it appears right, but as a matter of fact, the conclusion is wrong. So in, that, in other words, rhetoric and argument are related in the sense that they are both uh, tied in uh, with one foot in the truth. Um, but it, rhetoric reminds whoever makes an argument that the argument is not good enough. You've talked about the idea of winning an argument as a Western concept. What do you mean by that? There is a field uh, of research called comparative rhetoric. And they have pointed out that the idea that an argument is always to be considered as a contest, where one is winning and the other one is losing, uh, this might not be universal. But as a matter of fact, it's a kind of a characteristic of a Greco-Roman tradition of public speaking. And uh, the argument even goes back that this is tied up with military logic of uh, uh, an army where people are, where people are bearing arms, where kind of everybody's entitled to bear arms, where you have a militia. Uh, everybody's entitled to argue, and then the issue is that uh, it becomes a contest and, and one is winning or the other. Uh, this is very much a kind of seen as a, as a Greek tradition and an inheritance of Greece. So people have identified that this in China doesn't make much sense. Uh, maybe not even in India. That's kind of an argument one can find. Okay? So it might well be that winning an argument is, uh, is not a universal pursuit. So how do you win an argument? How do you win an argument? I think there are maybe three ways, and not all of them I would uh, subscribe, but they are known. The one is by bullshitting, uh, with heuristic tricks where basically your only concern is to win, uh, independent of whether you have uh, uh, the truth in the basket or not, or whether the other one has anything to contribute. So the crucial thing is you're winning. And there are, there's, a, there's a whole tradition of, of, of these tricks. Uh, the classic one is the attacking the person, okay? or uh, irritating, insulting the person, so that the other person loses control of the argument, and then, so these are, this is kind of a, a bullshitting. Uh, you're not really concerned about the truth, but you're concerned about winning and nothing but winning. The second one is uh, you win an argument by trying to find the better argument. Now, that is a bit of an issue. How, how do you find the better argument? Uh, maybe one has to do the research, one has to do the thinking, but one also has to have an open mind whether the other person might have the better argument. So you have to be open to be convinced in that sense, a certain openness. This also entails the, a concern for the conditions under which the better argument can win. It might not necessarily be that the argument itself is there, but you need to also create conditions. And these are the classic conditions of a, of a, of a discourse where, uh, for example, you don't want to win an argument uh, with a gun visible. Leave the gun out of the conversation is a, an idea. So there are certain conditions to be uh, maybe uh, the stage has to be set as well so that the, the better argument can win. 
And the third point of how to win an argument is uh, going back to the initial idea that winning might not be the only possibility here, but it might actually be winning over. So how do you win over? Which is uh, something to do with uh, uh, convincing, uh, something to do with uh, converting the other, uh, something to do with the, uh, inviting uh, a more open way of, uh, of coming together uh, in, a, in a joint pursuit of what might be what the argument wants to achieve, the argument wants to find the evidential uh, truth or something like that, and you might want to do this in a kind of a joint activity. Uh, so the third, the third uh, so three ways of winning the argument. Which method do you employ yourself, Martin? <laughs> Maybe bullshitting most of the time. <laughs> Sue was talking to Professor Martin Bauer. Alex Markoki from the Department of Government is one of the researchers on the Swarm Project. Its objective is to create a system that enables teams of people to come up with better arguments. The project is funded by the US intelligence community and evidently how these organisations interpret news data to form arguments has huge consequences. In 2016, the much-anticipated Iraq inquiry found significant flaws in the argumentation for invasion. Here's Sir John Chilcott, who led the inquiry. We have also concluded that the judgments about the severity of the threat posed by Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, WMD, were presented with a certainty that was not justified. Despite explicit warnings, the consequences of the invasion were underestimated. The planning and preparations for Iraq after Saddam Hussein were wholly inadequate. I asked Alex to summarise his understanding of arguments and in turn how this fed into the Swarm project. If I were to simplify this, um, there are broadly two schools of thought on this. Um, on the one hand, you have a group of people who think that, well, a good argument is an argument that can be formalized uh, into a valid inference in some system of logic, be it classical logic, non-classical logic, probabilistic logic. And, and uh, the normative force of an argument comes from the fact that it is a part of a formal system. Um, a lot of philosophers think that, um, logicians definitely think that. Um, another school of thought, however, is worried less about the possibility of formalizing an argument, but more about how the argument is constructed. An approach that focuses on rules of engagement for the argumentative process. It's more about what do you do when you argue? And do you do the right things when you argue? A good argument is one that is constructed by following the right procedures. For instance, it's an, a good argument is an argument in which you take into consideration possible counter arguments. It's an argument where you try to identify assumptions. A good argument is an argument where you uh, try to collect evidence. So the Swarm Project is part of this worldwide competition that was started uh, by the Intelligence Research Advanced Project Activity. Uh, and the idea of Swarm and of this competition is to construct ways through which teams can be better reasoners. Right? You, the, the main target of this project is obviously intelligence analysis because it is funded by the intelligence community in the US. But even outside of intelligence analysis, you have many fields, uh, many disciplines, many offices where people get together in a team to produce a report. And very often, uh, those reports are crucial for the work of that institution, uh, are very crucial for policy making. And the worry that a lot of people have is whether these reports are good or not. Now, the intelligence community has had some failures in, uh, in the past, as we all know, and they have started this, in, uh, this project to try to come up with good evidence-based ways for improving the quality of these reports. And the question they're asking is, are there ways in which you can structure the way teams um, talk to one another, members of a team talk to one another, such that the output of their discussions, the report that they ultimately produce, is better reasoned. And this is what the Swarm Project is trying to do. It's trying to find a structured way for teams to produce better reasoned reports. And so how have you gone about doing that? Um, well, our approach in, in Swarm is in a way informal. Um, what we try to do is we try to model some of the success stories that we see online for collaborative work. So, for instance, think of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a massively successful 
platform in which groups of people who don't even know each other collectively contribute to the same product. And very often the product they generate is of very high quality and it's very well reasoned. Um, so we're trying to harness that kind of uh, power of teams to work together and we're trying to construct a platform uh, that does that. In, in our platform teams um, first answer questions and generate individual reports without talking to one another. They come and they produce their own solution to the question at hand. Then they comment on each other's solutions, they edit, they rank their solutions. At the end of the day, the top ranked solution becomes a template for the team's report, and then they start working together on that final report, and then they submit it as a group. Uh, that's, what the, the, uh, that's what our platform does. And uh, in our initial testing, this has shown to be quite successful, and for teams to, to do uh, amazingly well and to produce really complicated and well-reasoned and well-researched reports. Have you got any examples that you could share? The examples we've been working with are um, mock geopolitical problems. Um, a, a lot of them are mock geopolitical problems. What makes this approach very successful is that when you have a lot of people that contribute in this way, uh, they also contribute their very diverse expertise. So uh, very often we see the case where uh, a particular problem requires a bit more uh, mathematical expertise or a bit more statistical expertise, and not everybody in the team has that expertise. But very often one of the mem one one member of the team uh, takes it upon themselves to do all the technical work, do the statistical work, explain to others, others. Uh, contribute to that, ask questions, improve the, the presentation of that statistical uh, analysis, and then they submit that as part of the team. Different people bring in their different skill sets into constructing the joint report. And I think that's what makes it a very successful approach. Are collectives of people always better than individuals at constructing arguments? I think this is still an open question. There is some evidence suggesting that uh, collectives are much better than individuals in making judgments, in making accurate judgments. Uh, start, for instance, with the famous example of the jar of jelly beans. Right? There's, there's, there are all these experiments showing that um, crowds are better at estimating the number of jelly beans in a jar than any individual is. Um, we know also from Philip Tetlock's work uh, that crowds are, are, are good or better than individuals at estimating geopolitical um, uh, events. Uh, you can, crowds are, are more accurate in making forecasts ab about political events. However, these are different kinds of questions than the question that we're after, namely good reasoning. Uh, it, it's still an open question whether crowds are better at reasoning, and it's also an open question whether crowds are better at recognizing good reasoning, but it's a question we're hoping to answer in this project. One important aspect in, in what we're doing, and, and part of the reason why such a platform could be successful, is that everybody who works on the platform has the same goal. They're all working towards producing the same report and uh, writing their name at the bottom of that single report. They, they come with the same motivations. They, they have different skills, they have different approaches to a problem, they have different understandings of the problem of how a good what a good report should look like. And this is something they can debate on the platform, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, they are all working towards the same end. And my final question is, how good it, are you at arguing? I don't think I'm any good at arguing. And to be honest, I'd be very suspicious of anyone who claimed expertise in anything and in arguing in particular. Uh, in, actually, we, we, we do have a, a, a long discussion in the project with regards to how to determine the gold standard in what a good argument is. And one thing we don't want to do is to come up with a profile of someone who's an expert in reasoning and then just ask them if they think the argument is good or not. Uh, in general, our approach is to be very wary of any kind of claims of expertise in reasoning. So, whether you're a multi-billion dollar government organization or an individual at Speaker's Corner, 
being able to construct and deconstruct arguments is a vital skill. To be good at arguing, you need to be able to listen, be consistent, use evidence, make the right inferences, don't tolerate intolerance, and of course, a little bullshit can help. But what do I know? One of the attendees at Speaker's Corner gave me his tips and suggested that winning or being proven right may not always be the answer. After you've spent an, enough time speaking to different people, you, you, and you've had your ideas tested, your, your ideas become more refined and you become more understanding of the different people and different cultures and so on. And uh, you start to change your views, but also you st the views that you do hold become more solid and then you learn the skills of how to communicate those views with different people. And, and um, I, I read a lot of information from books on the internet, but it's, it's nice to be here and to listen to people who are from that part of the world. Yeah. And you get it live, you know, so you've got your book, you've got the internet, but then you've got the actual people yeah. in front of you and it's like, it's, it's great. So no, it's important no. always to be in dialogue. That's right, that's right, that's the game, that's the game. Differences and uh, conflict is, is human. So the game is not to try and make everybody the same in order to reduce conflict. The, the, the goal is to uh, develop more sophisticated ways to manage the natural conflict, because the conflict is what makes people human. To so try and destroy the, the conflict or the, the differences is, uh, I think, is a very bad thing. This episode of LSEIQ was brought to you by James Ratti, Natalie Abbott, Sue Windybank, Shay Forbes-Taylor, Joe Bale, Tom Williams and Jess Winterstein. It was based in part on the following research. Beyond Monologicality, Exploring Conspiracist Worldviews by Bradley Franks, Adrian Van Goethe, Martin Bauer, Matthew Hall and Mark Noort in the journal Frontiers of Psychology, Providing a Broadcast Platform for Extremist Politicians is Unethical, by Bart Kamertz in the Polis Journalism and Society at the LSE blog, and information on the Swarm Project can be found at swarmproject.info. We were thrilled to win a Guardian University Award for Best Marketing and Comms Campaign last month, and would like to thank all our contributors and listeners who have helped make the LSE IQ podcast a success over the past year. For more episodes of this podcast, and to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and SoundCloud, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review on the Apple Podcasts app or on iTunes as it makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover. Join us next time when we ask, are cryptocurrencies the future of money?